Shabbat Shalom. Pastor Norm here, Ascension Ministries. You're watching the Elijah Report, our prophetic outreach. And with so many things going on um, in the world that can be related directly back to Bible prophecy, we just decided to, until further notice, do our Shabbat Torah studies around the prophetic word of God um, and put it under our banner, which is the Elijah Report, which is which are our prophetic updates. Because every day you can do a prophetic update because Bible prophecy is just unfolding as we go along. I got a really nice um, a letter from one of our partners. It was a card, and and um, uh, they were so partners, a couple. They were so um, gracious in that they were. Um, they were talking about how much they appreciated the ministry um, and that they've been listening for over 20 years. Um, and they said it was basically, and I'm just paraphrasing, it was one of the few ways that they could really understand what was going on and where we're at in Bible prophecy. And, you know, that's what we really try to do here. Uh, we don't try to hype anything up. We don't try to embellish on anything. We just give you the Word of God, and then we lay that down on top of what's going on in the world, and then we allow God's prophetic Word, the light of God's prophetic Word, just shine a light on those events so we can understand where we've been, where we are now, and where we're going in the near future. Um, because we are so close to major things happening. They're going to change this um, the world is already in the midst of transition, and we've talked about that, but there is there are events coming that are going to hit one, two, three, that are just going to totally erupt the whole world system and and bring about something new. And that's what we're trying to get everybody prepared for, because when it happens, if we aren't prepared for it in our understanding of what is coming, if we aren't prepared for that, and we don't understand that, when it happens, it will, it will cause men's heart to fail them for fear of what's coming up on the earth. And I'll be talking about that more in the days ahead and what that's going to look like because I guarantee you, I mean, you even got people now that, are, that can't handle what's going on. But when, these, when the big guns really start to, 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 to boom, um, on this earth, um, men's hearts will fail them for fear. Um, I hope everybody had a, a good Hanukkah season. Um, we just, um, Debbie and I just kind of laid low around here. We read the scriptures and, and prayed and lit the candles and, and uh, we just kind of rested um, the, 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 the summer and the fall around here on the farm just doing everything just really our little it's not a farm farm it's a little hobby farm and um just really keeps you busy you know <laughs> i don't know if it's keeping me younger or older i don't know but anyway um um we just pray that your your hanukkah was a blessed time um and that you were able to spend it with family and friends and just remember that that god is light and yeshua came um, as a light to the world, and he imparted his light to us so that we could be uh, a light to the nations. And um, that's what we're trying to do here. Um, that's what I was trying to do in ha this Hanukkah season, is to be a light to the nations, the light of revelation of God's prophetic word. Um, because it's so important that we understand his prophetic word. Um, he's very, very clear about that. Uh, because prophecy reveals the beginning to the ending. Not just the ending, but the beginning to the ending. And I've shared all that before, but I have to mention it again because Bible prophecy is one of the most important tools in the hand of God and His servants that know how to handle it um, to bring the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah and the times that we live uh, to the world, to the body of Messiah, and to the world. And so we hope that you've been enjoying these teachings and, and um, that they've been a blessing to you and to your families. Um, the, um, um, 
Uh, we've been talking about, we, we've been doing this biblical roadmap um, to the return of Christ. Um, and we started in several weeks ago in part 10, we started connecting the dots of the strong delusion um, to the mystery of Babylon. And then the following week, we connected that and we began to show you how, how Allah, the ancient star gods in the UFO delusion, um, are, 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 we must understand that in order to understand the unraveling um, and how to unravel the mystery of Babylon. And uh, because it's all connected, and you'll see that as we go along. And we showed you how Satan has consolidated all the Babylonian Canaanite star gods into one false god named Allah. And you can see um, um, the star of Allah there, and, and you can also see the moon goddess. And, and then we showed you how the star of Allah is the ancient star of Rampha that Israel carried around the wilderness uh, for 40 years. And this was a form of worshiping the heavenly host. And we know that because the writer of Acts in chapter 7, beginning in verse 42, tells us that. Um, he says this, But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of, of the prophets. And this is talking about the time that they were wandering in the wilderness. God, you know, because they rejected God all the way up to the land. I mean, the, 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 the Baal Peor and the sin of, of Balaam and so on and so forth. Um, they continued to disbelieve God even after he delivered them out of Egypt. The, the, the dynamic and powerful way that he did they refused to believe that they could go in and take that promised land and slay the giants, which we'll get to later on. And, and so God said, all right, you aren't going to believe me? Then you're just going to wander 40 years in the wilderness until this next generation uh, rises out of you, and I'll bring them in. And, and you know what? If they would have rejected God's uh, command to go in and take the land, <laughs> they they continued to wander until another generation came up. You, you must understand, God is going to have His way, whether we agree with it or cooperate with it or not, and that's why we need to repent and come back to His way in all in all our ways. Amen. I, I I'm that that'll preach, but I don't have time for that today. We all know that, okay, um, and so. Um, he said that he says that God gave them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. And then he quotes from Amos chapter five, verses twenty-five and twenty-seven, that says this: "It was not to me that you offered victims of sacrifice forty years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? Of course not, because he just said he gave them up to worship the host of heaven." So it was a host of heaven that they were that they were sacrificing to, and verse forty three tells us exactly who that was. You also took along the tabernacle of Molech. Molech is a star god; he's part of the host of heaven, and the star of God of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. And we see that the star of Allah is also now. You must understand the, whether whether the Islamists know this or not. The star of Allah is the star of Rampha. It is just the modern day star of Rampha that's been woven into the consolidation of all the star gods of ancient Babylon and Canaanite um, pagans. And that has come out the other side as Allah. And that is, and it will unfold, and I'll show you that as we go through this series, it will unfold as the star of Rampha, the star gods, um, which, uh, which Israel even worshipped in the wilderness. Nothing changes, it just repeats itself, amen? There's nothing new under the sun. Everything that has been, will be. Um, and so we're seeing that repeat itself, and you can see there the moon goddess, as I mentioned earlier, you've got the moon goddess that, that's kind of wrapped in. Now, the upside-down pentagram symbolizes, it carries, a, uh, it carries a demonic message, and it symbolizes uh, Baphomet and the goat of Mendez in satanic worship. 
Now, now whether the whether the Islamists understand that or not, that's what it's talking about. The devil doesn't change his ways; he will just change the imagery many times, and and just change it enough so we don't recognize it. Especially if you don't uh, understand or study history, you won't recognize the new stuff that he's coming, which is the same thing. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? And so this is the demonic host of heaven that we're talking about here. And you can see there on the left that this, is, uh, this also represents Baphomet um, that's set up outside the Arkansas State Capitol. Here, here it is. This was several years ago now. But here's one recently. Ken sent this to me this morning, in fact. And I, and I worked it into this teaching is that this is the Christmas Baphomet that's set up inside Iowa State Capitol building. And I'm going to get to this later, but this whole satanic worship thing is being, is being forced upon even America. This is happening around the world, folks. It's not, just, it's not just ancient times, and it's not just here in America. It's happening all over the world. And, and we have to understand that this is... This is moving toward the forced worship of anti-Messiah. And the center of the goat's head carries a demonic end-time mystery, and that's this mystery of Babylon that we're talking about. And that um, it, if you take the center of, of this um, goat's head right here and you turn it upside down, you get a face, and I've already shown you this. That face is Yoda, that lovable little guru of the Force that everybody loves. When when Star Wars comes out, came out. I remember, I remember, <laughs> I remember that McDonald's came out with a Happy Meal that you could you could drive through, um, pick up your Happy Meal for your kids, and you get the, your little Yoda doll in there. It was a little Yoda idol. And, and you must understand, and I'll talk more about this in, in future uh, teachings, is that, is that the world has been conditioned to receive um, th this phenomenon as being from other planets uh, in the days ahead. That's part of the strong delusion. And, and the thing about it is this, folks, is that is that, that is knocking at our door right now. We're seeing it unfold in the news, on television, in the newspapers, and magazine articles, and so on and so forth. And, and the devil is making the case that there are extraterrestrials. And when the world is ready to accept something like that, um, that's when I believe they're going to step onto the scene. And I just, I said all that, to say that we have to understand the root of it and that it's part of the strong delusion. And over the course of the next several weeks, I'm going to show you how that unfolds. And I'm even going to show you about the counterfeit rapture that's going to take place. Now, I know that's a lot to try and unpack. Um, that's why I'm not going to try and do it in like one or two sessions. I want to do it so that you're that you have the scripture verses, you can think about it, you can meditate on it, you can send me questions that I'll try to answer uh, during the webcast, and if I can't, I will, I'll, I'll answer you uh, personally um, via email or whatever, and um, we'll just kind of go from there. But, but it's not just about saying that that's what it is, which is, that's what it is. We have to understand that from a biblical perspective, and as important, how it's going to unfold in the days ahead. I, I hope you'll receive that and be patient as we go through all of this. Um, and that's where we have to understand that the Star of Allah that you see there is the Star of Ramfa. I don't think there's any question about it. And so this is part of, and, and, and last week, or two weeks ago, I shared with you how we can't really understand all of this. Because this is directly tied to the abomination of desolation, which is all part of the mystery of Babylon, and the and the and the heavenly host, the 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 the, the um, uh, end time scenario that comes, the mystery of Babylon, the strong delusion, um, is all tied to the abomination of desolation, 
And last week we showed you how there was a, um, two partial fulfillments of what happened with Alexander, um, who died when he conquered uh, the Mede Persians. Um, he ruled for a while, and then, uh, but then he died very young, and he divided the kingdom up into four among four kings and four regions. And the insolent king is what Daniel, how Daniel describes him, uh, rose to power out of the Seleucid Empire. That's the that's the Persian. Uh, empire of the Greek Empire, the Persian part. That would include Syria and Iran and Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way to the borders of, of India. Um, and Antiochus took the name Epiphanes, which means God manifest. Um, he made a decree that the Jews had to denounce their faith in Yahweh and become one people with the Greeks. And that's happening today, folks. I'm telling you, that is, that, that's what the devil is trying to put on America, especially right now, is to get Christianity out of the schools and let, and let Satanism in there. Um, Ken and I were talking this morning, um, and he pointed out, and I've talked about this before, is that, is that they're starting all these uh, satanic club, after-school satanic clubs. You can't have an after-school Christian club, but you can have an after-school satanic club, and you can see how that's permeating and coming into our culture, and we have to be able to stand against that, amen, hallelujah. And they were forced to stop, they were, they were forced to stop practicing religious customs of God's Torah. That's why the Torah, getting back to the Torah, is so important. And embrace the Greek culture of Hellenism and the gods of Greek mythology, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the interpretation and initial fulfillment of Hanukkah's vision um, was was set up, took place during that time of Antiochus Epiphanes, and that's where he set up the abomination of desolation on on the temple altar and forced everyone to worship its image and obey its religious customs. And you can see that that was, and I went through this last week, that was the statue of Zeus. I showed you what that was, but I didn't go into the depths of what it represented, That which is what we're gonna do today. But, but look at this now. Can you see the resemblance there? Baphomet, Zeus, and this, and this um, idol right here on the, on the altar? And you can even see you've got the moon goddess there, and you've got the moon goddess down here. This is all about the worship of the heavenly host that is rising up again um, throughout society in many different areas, and this is just one of those areas. And, and, but when it comes, when it actually manifests, what will that look like when it reappears? Because it's not going to be a statue of Baphomet. That would be too controversial, and the, the, world, the world would split right down the middle. So there has to be, and that could very easily happen, but then there has to be something that brings the world back together under, under one faith, because there is a mystery Babylon, which is the, which, uh, which is the uh, mystery of religious Babylon. There's, there's political Babylon, financial Babylon, which are, I've, I've made evident to you for 20 some years. And, and then, but then there's also religious Babylon, which I've talked about in the past, and I've done pieces on it here and there and so on and so forth. But this is the time when I need to go into the whole thing and work that into our series on the um, uh, biblical roadmap to the return of Messiah. So, so the question is this, what will that look like when it reappears and how does it connect with the end time mystery of Babylon? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about Hanukkah versus Hellenism, Zeus and the heavenly host of Greek mythology. Um, it's really important that we understand how all of this comes together and how it's gonna manifest in the last days because this is a repeat. Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place that Daniel talked about, and then it says, let the reader understand. 
Okay, we need to understand this because if we don't understand it, we'll be seduced in the, in the last days. And that seduction has already started to take place. And you can see the world following this seduction in awe and just, just uh, mesmerized by it and so on and so forth. But it's all demonic and this will help you to understand how it's coming so that you won't be seduced. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this teaching. We thank you for your spirit, Holy Spirit, that you would give us wisdom and understanding as we draw from our series on Christmas or Hanukkah, unraveling the December dilemma, that, Lord, you would help us to divide between the holy and the unholy, the righteous and the unrighteous, the clean and the unclean, that which is of you and that which is of the devil, so that we would follow you and only you in Yeshua the Messiah. We pray your blessing upon us, Lord God, as we go into this and your revelation and understanding in Yeshua's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for watching. Let's, let's watch the teaching now. It will be a blessing to you, I guarantee. So what is the abomination of desolation? That takes us back to the Maccabees 1, and I want to reread this for, for today's uh, uh, message. Is that Maccabees 1, beginning in verse 54, says, Now on the 15th day of Keslev, Keslev is, is, is usually in December, November, December. In the, in the 145th year, they created a desolating sacrilege upon the altar of burnt offerings. And, and most of your theologians will say that, that that sacrilege, that idol, that image was the image of Zeus. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Now, the 25th day of the 145th year of, uh, of Keslev, the, and the 141st, 45th, excuse me, the 145th year of the Seleucid, uh, that was during the winter solstice in the Seleucid era, and, and one of the estimated dates is December 16th, 168 B.C., during the winter solstice season. They also built altars in the surrounding cities of Jerusalem and burned incense at the doors of the houses and in the streets. The books of the law, that, that would be the Torah, which they found were torn to pieces and burned with fire, where the book of the covenant, that's the Torah also, was found in the possession of anyone, or if anyone adhered to the Torah, the decree of the king condemned him to death. In other words, if you practiced the, the, the laws of God, you were condemned to death during this time. Verse 58. They kept using violence against Israel, against those found mouth to mouth in the cities. And now listen to this. On the 25th day of the month Keslev, they offered sacrifice. And most of your theologians will tell you that was most likely a pig. That's what the history points out. On they, they offered a sacrifice on the altar, which was upon the altar of burnt offerings. In other words, there's this image of Zeus with an altar to Zeus on it that was set on top of the altar of God in the temple. That never happened in 70 AD in Rome. Does everybody understand that? We, you've got to get a hold of that. Because if you don't get a hold of that and you think everything happened back in 70 AD, you're going to miss what's coming. And, you, and you're actually, I believe, you could be cannon fodder for Antichrist. Amen. And I, I'll teach on that some other time. <sighs> I can't go there. I, I've got so much to get through. So this is my, yeah, my wife says I'm doing good. In fact, she told me, she said, well, if you get off track, I'm going to throw stuff at you. So if you see something come up here and uh, come up here at me, you know, you know, I'm getting off track and she's trying to get me back on. <laughs> okay. Now, now this 20, uh, excuse me, this 25th day of the month of Keslev was estimated. Now there are different estimates out there. I'm using this one because I think it, it's probably the most accurate. Was, was, was approximately December 26th. It was right in the middle, or it was, it was in and around the, the, uh, the uh, winter solstice, December 26th, 168 B.C. Now, what qualifies now as the abomination of desolation? 
The abomination of desolation sets up a graven image in Yahweh's temple and throughout the nation and forces everyone to worship that image and everything it stands for. Does everybody hear that? Everything it stands for. Number two. Now that's the prime. That's the primary thing. Okay. The secondary thing is that it outlaws the true religion of Yahweh and forces everyone to abandon the Torah and obey pagan law under penalty of death. Okay. Now. That brings us to session three. Today's session is session three. Hellenism, Zeus, and the abomination or the abominations, I could say, of Greek mythology. And, and the Lord has just spoken to me so clearly. And he has said, help the people understand, help my people understand what actually was the abomination in that day because Yeshua said when you see that abomination standing in the holy place let the reader understand you know what I don't think we understand what truly what the abomination of desolation was in that day I've never heard anybody teach on it well get ready because here it comes what specific abomination did Hellenism and Zeus, which was the Greek mythology, because he, he was the head dog, what specific abomination did Hellenism and Greek mythology represent? Good question. I'm so glad you asked. In order to talk about that, bring it up to the time in which they were, in which they were dealing with this abomination of desolation, we have to go back and do a little bit of a study of Greek mythology. I've just been pouring into that this week. I never really studied it. I studied a little bit in school, but never like I did this week. And please hear me. It is like a never-ending dysfunctional family. I mean, that's what, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's, I, I, I can't even go there. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm extrapolating and I'm bringing into, I'm bringing into a vision here uh, some central themes, some central characters, and, 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 and what Israel was looking at at that time when Antiochus Epiphanes was demanding that they give up their Torah and follow the laws of of Greek mythology that's really that's what it was that's what he was asking them to do and it goes back to that in the beginning there were various primordial forces now this is Greek mythology this is not what I believe okay thank you, <laughs> yeah, thank you. yes my wife says be sure to say that the first primordial force was chaos. Because what comes out of chaos? Order. Order. Yeah. I want to tell you what. The devil hasn't changed his plan. Okay. The first primordial force was chaos. A sort of nothingness. Black hole or chaotic swirling. Disorder or state of conflict. Man, it kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Gaia, the earth, came next. Eros, which is love, and tar Tartarus, the underworld, or Hades, came about the same time. Chaos, Gaia, Eros, and Tartarus are not, number, are not a number generation because these forces were not generated, born, or otherwise created. They were considered eternal and therefore before the first generation. In other words, they always have been. Therefore, they are called generation zero. When you're doing the generational thing, this is what a lot of people that study Greek mythology, they call this generation zero, which is the equivalent of being the creator God. That's what they're set up to be, the creator God. Well, what does is, what is the creator God Yahweh say about this? Here's what he says. And this flies in the face now of what the Bible says. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the beginning God, and that's talking about Yahweh. It doesn't use his name there, but it's talking about yod heh vav -Heh, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Sounds like chaos, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And darkness was over the surface of the earth. And you must understand what pagan religions and counterfeit religions do is that they take truths of God and they pervert them. 
and they ascribe different gods and or different belief systems to what God does. That's part of the abomination. But it's not the abomination of desolation. It is the counterfeit. It's the counterfeit of God. They're, they're basically impersonating Yahweh, who is the creator and the sovereign of all. Amen? That's what these pagan religions do. Job says, because you remember, Tartarus was the underworld or Hades. Here's what Job says about that in verse five, uh, Job 26, verse 5. The departed spirits tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Naked is Sheol. That's talking about the underworld or Hades. Naked is Sheol or the underworld before him, before Yahweh. And Abaddon, which, would, it's, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, who in Greek mythology was Tartarus, has no covering. And, and the bottom line is this, is that Yahweh is the God of all. He created everything. He created the heavens, the earth. He even created hell. And there is no God but Yahweh. And he says, even hell is open to me. And the, and the leader of hell, Abaddon, the angel of the bottomless pit, which in Greek mythology was Tartarus, he has no covering. He can't hide from me because I am all powerful and I am sovereign. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I'm drawing the distinctions here. And this is why it was so hard for Israel to bow down and worship this thing because this is part of what it represented. And if we don't understand that, we're going to miss what's coming in the days ahead and what is actually already here in many respects right now. So generation zero, here's, here's, generation, here's what happened in generation zero. Gaia, the great mother creator, created and then mated with Uranus, the god of the heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon and the stars, and also Pont, uh, Pontos, which is the god of the sea. She also produced the mountains, but did not mate with them. I think that's why God says, flee to the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> that just cracks me up. I don't know why. Flee to the mountains. That's because Gaia didn't mate with the mountains, so we're safe in the mountains. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Now, generation one, from Gaia's union with Uranus came the Hecatonchires. And these were just, these were just, they were also called uh, hundred handers who were the gods of violent storms. Okay. A uh, hundred hands doesn't mean they had a hundred hands. That means that they were like a hundred hands high. So they were, they were considered gigantous. Um, there were three cyclopses that came from that. And you can go in, you can do study after study on that. We don't want to do that. But then came the first generation of titans also came out of Gaia's union with Uranus. Now these are giants. Does that sound like something maybe in the scriptures? Does that sound a little bit like Genesis chapter 6? See, because here the devil takes this Genesis 6 and he's going to pervert it in the Greek mythology. But let's look at what Genesis 6 says. It says, there were giants, the Hebrew word is Nephilim, on the earth and those, and this is the days of Noah, right? This is the days of Noah. So this is very ancient. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Now, now, what are the sons of God? Let's go to the tr today's living Bible and let's read that. And let's see if we can't get a little better understanding of what the sons of God were. Here's what it says in Genesis 6 and verse 4 in the living Bible. It says this. In those days and even afterwards, when the evil beings from the spirit world were sexually involved with human women, their children became giants of whom so many legends are told. And isn't that what Greek mythology is? It's a bunch of legends and folklore. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to say this, is that, is that they, they, they took, they extrapolated from what has taken place in the past and they twisted it and perverted it and they used it in the, in the, uh, in the Greek mythology. Now we're going to come back to that in, in a little bit. The first generation of Titans, or the first generation of giants, were Kronos, the god of time, Rhea, the mother of the gods, Krios, ram, or strong ruler, Koios, god, the god of inquiry, uh, Phoebe, the goddess of brilliance and, and, and intellect, uh, Oceanus, which is the god of the oceans and the rivers, and Tethys, the god of childbirth, uh, Hyperon, 
the god of light, Thea, the goddess of light for the brilliance of sight, uh, Lapitus, the god of morality, Nemosyne, goddess of, m- of memory, and, and Themis, the goddess of good counsel and divine law. Who's the god of divine law? Is the God of divine law is Yahweh. Amen. And the law, the Torah, is his teaching and his instructions. That's the key, not the teachings and the instructions of these pagan uh, gods. Okay. now from the Titan pair Kronos and his sister Rhea, because they were mating. That's what I mean. Dysfunctional family like you can't believe. Okay. everybody is sleeping with everybody and their intermarriage. And uh, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, from the Titan pair Kronos and his sister Rhea came the first Olympian gods. And Zeus was the first one that, that, that uh, of that. He was, now, and I should say he's the first, but he was the supreme father of the Olympian gods. He's the god of men, nature, sky, weather, thunder, law, and order. He was the supreme father of all the Olympian gods. That's who was set up on the altar of abomination, that that abomination of desolation on the altar of God at that time. And we must understand that that image represented Greek mythology as a whole and how it had permeated into the Hellenistic, the Greek culture uh, at the time. And Antiochus was saying, you have to bow down and you have to worship and you have to follow uh, this theology. Okay? Now... Zeus was born during the winter solstice. Some say, specifically, he was born on December 25th. I can't verify that, but we do know that he was born during the the winter solstice. It could have been December 25th. That's why Antiochus set up Zeus's image in the temple and sacrificed when? In December. And and, and according to my calculations, what I've seen, there are several different... different, uh, 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 calculations out there. That was December 26th. Could be a day off, huh? Yeah. But that's why they set that up and that's why they sacrificed at that time because they were celebrating his birthday. They were honoring his birthday. He became the king of heaven and the upper earth after he overthrew the Titans, including his father, and imprisoned them in Tartaros. He gave Poseidon the sea and Hades the underworld for their domains. So he's divvying things up now because he is the supreme father god of the Olympians. He won the war of the Gigantus. That's the hundred uh, giant offspring of Gaia who attempted to storm Mount Olympus. These are just some of his exploits that he did because he did mighty exploits. Okay. He flooded the earth. This is one of the other myths that he flooded the earth with a great deluge to destroy mankind and begin the world anew. How many of you know that is that's ascribed to Yahweh? But we must understand he's taken that truth because there's evidence of a worldwide flood all over the place. So he took that truth and twisted it and said that it was Zeus rather than Yahweh. And again, we must understand, this is what the abomination of, of, of desolation that was on the temple altar, that's what it represented. That's why, that's why the Jews could not, I mean, most of them could not, they could not bow down. There's always apostates among God's people. Does everybody hear me? There's always apostates, whether you're Jew or Gentile. There's always apostates, okay? They will teach a false religion. They will follow a false religion. And some of them even do it in the name of Yahweh. But that doesn't make it true. It makes it still still false. Okay, um, from Cronus and Rhea also came Hera, which is the mother of the Olympian gods, the goddess of the cosmos or the heavens, and of women. She's the goddess of women. Poseidon, the Olympian god of the sea, and Hades, there was actually a god named Hades, the Olympian god of the underworld or hell, okay? Demeter, which is, which is the Olympian goddess of grain, um, the worship of Demeter was based on the story of the abduction of her daughter, uh, per, per, uh, per, Persephone, Persephone, yes. And here is a here is a picture, not a picture, but here is a sculpture of the abduction of Demeter's daughter Persephone. Now keep that in your memory banks because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Okay. 
As a result of Persephone's abduction, Demeter cursed the earth with winter each year. That's how Greek mythology teaches that winter came. That's how it was in instituted. Well, who instituted winter? What does the scripture say? Psalm 74, verse 16. Yours, talking, talking to Yahweh, yours is the day. Yours is also the night. Yours, you have prepared the light and the sun. He's created all of this. It wasn't just, they weren't always there. He created it. You have established all the boundaries of earth, of the earth, and you have made summer and what? Winter. So this flies in the face of Greek mythology, and that's why we, you can't give into it. That's why the Jews could not give into it. From the Titan pair, Cronus and Rhea also came Hestia, which is the goddess of the hearth. She's considered to uh, she found she's a, she's considered the founder of the family and of the state. She maintained public reverence for the gods as the center of Greek religious life. She's the one who made sure everybody did it right. This goddess. Her name was invoked at the beginning and at the end of all solemn pl public oaths and sacrifices. In other words, when they got done praying, they would say in the name of Hesta. Just like we would say in the name of Yeshua, they would say in the name of Hesta. Remember, this is about counterfeiting. This is about bringing in a counterfeit. Also, for, uh, and, then, and then there was another Titan pair, Hyperna, which was a god of light, and also Thea, the goddess of light for sight. They were brother and sister. They mated, and, and out of all of that light came Helios, the sun god, which actually he was considered the sun manifest. And you can see a picture right down here and then also a sculpture right there. And you can see he's got this solar blaze, this solar sunburst behind his head. And it was said that he would ride in a chariot followed uh, or led by four fire breathing horses and that basically he would go across the sky every day and that he would, he would report back to all the gods because he could see everything that was going on. So he was the one who, who if something needed to be shared with the gods, like with Zeus, that he would report back to them because he was watching everybody. And that's just one of the folklores. Also from Hyper, Hyperion and from Thea came Selene, the moon goddess, and Eos, the goddess of the dawn. What does the scripture say about that? God's very clear. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 19. And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them. You know, it was really, I, I can understand a little bit why it was difficult for some people uh, not to worship the sun and the moon and the stars because you have to understand is that, is, that, is that the stars would like move. And the sun would move during the day and the moon would move and it would come and it would go. And, and, and the ancients who didn't have the word of God, you must understand, they thought that they were alive and so they worshiped him. And that's why the Torah is so important that we come back to it because, because God's very clear. He says, don't you worship them. You're going to be tempted to worship them because they're up there moving around. Don't you worship them. See, God is spirit. That's why we can't make images of him. And you know what? It takes real faith to venerate God because he's spirit. Is that right? Yeah. But those who worship him, those who worship Yahweh, those who worship his Messiah will worship him in spirit and truth. Amen. Not with idols, not with images. And that image that was on that, on that altar, we must understand, goes against everything that's Torah. And that's going to repeat in the last days. What about the dawn? Look at 2 Peter verse one, or chapter 1, verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure. King, Je King James says the sure word of prophecy, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the what? Day dawns. There is no uh, Eros, the God, or I should say the Eos, the God of the dawn, because Yahweh is the God who created the dawn. You don't worship the dawn. You don't worship the sun. You don't worship the moon. You worship Yahweh, the creator of all of that. 
until the day dawns and the morning star, which in God's morning star is Yeshua. The devil's morning star is Venus, a planet goddess, one of the, one of the planetary worship, one of the planets that a lot of people worship. It's the counterfeit. The second generation also produced mythical Greek monsters. The chimera was a mythic uh, beast that had a lion's head, a serpent's tail, and a goat's head sticking out its side. The chimera was the offspring of of Typhon and Echidna. Typhon was the last son of Gaia, fathered by Tartus. In other words, Gaia created Tartus, which was hell, and then mated with him. And he was the most deadly monster of Greek mythology. And then he mated, um, uh, Typhon, mated with Echidna. And Echidna was half woman and half snake, known as the mother of all monsters. In fact, in fact, uh, Typhon was also known as the father of all monsters. So mother and father got together and they produced the chimera. And, and the reason she's known as the father or the mother of all monsters is because she, uh, she actually uh, gave birth to most of the mon- monsters in Greek, mi- uh, in Greek myth were actually mothered by her. And I don't have time to go into that. I just want to show you. You must understand, here's what the devil's doing. The devil is working uh, genetic, mixing the gene pool, so to speak. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Typhon and and Echidna also gave birth to Cerberus, a three-headed dog that was given to Tartarus to guard the gates of hell. Here's a little statue of Cerberus or Tartarus and his three-headed dog, Cerberus. There's a closer look at it that guarded the gates of hell. And everybody knows about that in, in, in mythology. Poseidon and Gaia gave birth to, and, and, and Poseidon would have been uh, Gaia's um, uh, nephew, okay? Gave birth to Karadeb. <laughs> anyway, huh? <laughs> I, I, I looked it up on the uh, I looked it up and there's a there's a program you can go to and you can click it and put it in there and it actually pronounces it for you. Uh, Charybdis, there it is, Charybdis. Uh, she was a sea monster resembling a great whirlpool. Who's the god of the sea? Yeah, Job. Look at Job 26 verse 10. He talking about Yahweh. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. There's your rope pole. He's the one who gave it, the circle in the surface of the water. Mm -hmm. The pillar of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. Verse 12, he quieted the sea with his power and by his understanding, he shattered Rahab. Now that's not the Rahab that that we're familiar to. This Rahab was the name of a mystical female sea monster of chaos associated with Leviathan. So God's very clear. He shattered her. We must understand that Yahweh is head and shoulders over all of them. By his breath, the heavens are cleared. His hand has pierced the fleeing spirit. Ah, There she goes. Now, and I'm doing this so that you can understand what's coming in the future. Mm -hmm. Because all of these different gods are out there already, and they're all going to start coming to the surface, and there's going to be a move by the world to come together and to worship them. And I want to tell you this, if you don't understand that, you can be caught up in it, and and it even gets worse. You'll see that here in a minute. I got to get moving. I'm I'm running way behind schedule. Oh, my wife's going to throw something at me. Okay, Zeus now, this is the third generation. The third generation came, and and the first pair we're going to talk about is Zeus married his sister Hera. But now listen to this. Zeus had many offspring with other female goddesses as well as mortal human women. In other words, today they would call him a player, okay? He He was out and about, okay? Apollo, the god of archery, hunting, music, prophecy... 
Uh, his mother was the Olympian goddess Leto. Um, he, was, uh, he was one of his offspring. Artemis was Apollo's twin sister. And she was the goddess of the hunt, wild animals, the wilderness, childbirth, virginity, and young girls. Mm-hmm. Athena, whose father was Zeus and mother was Metis, um, even though Metis was her mother, she was born out of Zeus's head. Mm-hmm. Zeus had this headache, okay, and it's weird stuff, okay, and 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 she was actually born out of his head. And, but she was Zeus's favorite daughter and the goddess of warfare, courage, wisdom, strategy, strength, civilization, and justice. Okay, so he gave her a lot. Hercules. Um, now this is now this is something we we must understand. Hercules is also one of the offspring of Zeus, but his mother was a mortal human woman named Alcmene, which made Hercules a demigod or half god and half human. Does that kind of sound familiar? That takes us back to where? That takes us back to Zeus. Here's Zeus and Alcmene. This is where Zeus actually takes on the form of Alcmene's husband and seduces her. Okay? And what does the scripture say? This takes us back to Genesis chapter 6 mm-hmm. and verse 4. And I'm going to read it from the Living Bible, the, the, the today's Living Bible. It says this. In those days and even afterwards, when the evil beings from the spirit world were sexually involved with women, with human women, their children became giants or Nephilim, of whom so many legends are told. Now, Enoch, the book of Enoch, puts it this way. And the book of Enoch was was read during the time of the Maccabees. The book of Enoch is, has been, has been in, in Jewish literature for a long, long time. And you'll see that, and, even, and it's even, parts of it are even ascribed, uh, or I should say parts of the New Testament in Jude are even ascribed to it, uh, um, uh, ascribed to the book of Enoch. But here's what the book of Enoch, chapter 6 and verse 2 says, And the angels, it, do, it doesn't call them sons of God, it doesn't call them evil beings from the spirit world he calls them angels okay and the angels the children of heaven saw and lusted after them and said to one another come let let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget children could it be that zeus was a fallen angel who seduced elkmeni because, see, this thing is coming to, to a head. And I'm not going to go into an in-depth teaching because I don't have time. Uh, Dr. L.A. Marzulli and I did a conference out here in June. Uh, that teaching, that whole conference is on our website. I encourage you to get it because between the two of us, we pretty much put to rest any issue of whether or not these fallen angels are posing as something else. What could that be? Here's what the book of Enoch goes on to say in Enoch 15, verse 3. He says, Wherefore you have left the high, holy, and eternal heaven, and have lain with women, and defiled yourselves with daughters of men. And you must understand, this is, this is part of what was being worshipped in the temple, with Zeus's image in there, okay? And taken to yourself wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants as your sons. Jude draws from Enoch when he says this. Jude 1 verse 6 says, Remember the angels who did not stay within the limits of their uh, authority. King James says, Who left their first estate, but abandoned their own dwelling place. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah and the nearby towns whose people acted as those angels did and indulged in sexual immorality and perversion. It's very clear. That these angels were coming down. Gods from the sky were coming down and mating with mortal human women. I want to tell you what. Greek mythology just took a, just took a piece of the Bible and, and, and perverted all of that and brought it into its mythology. That's where it comes from. Because, you know, mostly, almost all of your myths have some basis in fact. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? That's why we have to understand what's coming because it's, it was Zeus, Hellenism, and everything that it represented in Greek mythology that's coming in the days ahead. It's not going to be called Greek mythology. 
But it's going to be the same spirit. It's going to be the same manifestations to one degree or another. And that's why we've got to understand it. That's why this thing didn't end in 70 AD, honey. That's right. Remember the abduction of Demeter's daughter? Persephone? Mm-hmm. Boy, does that look familiar? Now, what could that abduction be reflected in today? What abductions today could be that same thing? Could it be? Ooh. Does this equate with the alien abductions of today? I don't have time to teach on that, but I think that that is something that's coming in the days ahead because that, not, not the alien abduction, but, but, but the whole God's coming down from the sky and ruling and ruling and, and doing all their weird stuff and even mating with the daughters of men. Please hear me. That's just a repeat of Genesis chapter 6 in the days of Noah. And that's what Yeshua said. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. This is part of the abomination of desolation that's coming, folks. Now, you never heard a Hanukkah story like this. I know that. Okay? But the Lord said, tell my people to understand what's coming because it's that abomination that Yeshua said, let the reader understand. We need to understand what that was because that's what's coming again and here it is. Thus says the Lord. How many of you still love me? Okay, I got a few hands here. I see a couple hands out there and watching on the internet. All right, praise the Lord. (laughs) Minnow, the king of Crete, um, he was the son of Zeus and Europa. Remember Europa had this thing with a bull? We're not going to go with her. We're going to go with her with her daughter. His his wife, or I should say, uh, Minnow, his wife, uh, Pasipha, she made it with a bull and she gave birth to a minotaur. Mm-hmm. Now, what does the Bible say about that? Leviticus 18, verse 23. Mm-hmm. Also, you shall not have intercourse with any animal to be defiled with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. Yeah, do you believe that? Centaurs were really big in those days too. Wow, are they doing some mixing today? Please hear me, the spirit of the world. See, the whole thing about the devil is that he wants to mix. He wants to pervert God's creation by mixing the gene pool, uh, uh, animals with men and plants and, and mixing it all together. Mixing human DNA and animal DNA is happening in today's laboratories, folks. Nothing has changed. The spirit behind that is the same spirit of the abomination of desolation and everything it stood for on on the altar. Here's what God says about that. He says, if there is a man who lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. And then look at that that next part there. You shall also kill the animal. Why would they want to kill the animal? Could it be that there was that there was some something happened where there might have been offspring? That's why the animal was killed too. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Because every myth is based in reality. I shouldn't say every myth, but most myths are based in reality. So God says you won't do it. And if something happens where somebody does, you kill the man and the animal so you can't propagate this. Comes right out of Greek mythology. Well, Theus, or uh, uh, Theseus, he slayed the centaur. That's biblical. See, they even drew that from the Bible. Theseus also slayed the minotaur. Theseus really had it out for those guys. I do too. It's a perversion. The lineage of the Greek gods and their exploits began to dwindle because of the rise of the Roman Empire and their ultimate defeat of Greece. Rome began to embrace many of the Greek gods as their own, but, everybody say but, but but under different names. In other words, there was an evolution where the gods of Greece evolved. Let's take a look. Zeus of Greece and the gods of Olympus evolved in the, to the celestial gods of Rome. These were gods that came down from the sky, Zeus and so on and so forth, but now they're evolving into the celestial gods of Rome. For example, Zeus, 
becomes Jupiter of Rome. Eros of Greece, remember Eros, the goddess of love? Mm -hmm. She became Cupid of Rome. Ooh. Where's that today? What do we see that today? Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, now I know some of you are just wish you hadn't tuned in. You know, love me or hate me, folks. I'm just I'm just giving you the truth. <laughs> and I hope we don't lose anybody because of that. But the bottom line is you need to love your sweetheart every single day, especially on Shabbat. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. But you have to understand that's the Greco-Roman culture that we're in. Hera of Greece, she became Juno of Rome, who also became today Columbia of Hollywood, who's also the Statue of Liberty. Does everybody see how that spirit continues? Didn't stop, it just took a little different form. Athena of Greece became Minerva of Rome, who became the freedom goddess in America which is on top of the Capitol building. Does everybody understand? Yeah. Okay. Helios of Greece, the sun god, he became Sol Invictus of Rome. Sol is just means sun, and Invictus is means invincible. The unconquered sun. Ooh, sounds familiar, doesn't it? We'll get to that later. Pagan worship, transition from one empire to another. We're talking about Greece and how mythology had transitioned now, was transitioning. All these Greek gods now are transitioning. And that whole thing transitioned into Rome. Okay, Now, now here's the key. Is that, is that Hellenism was widely worshipped or was widely practiced even in the Roman Empire. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The, the, the Temple of Zeus was still, people still went to the Temple of Zeus. It didn't, it didn't necessarily change to the Temple of Jupiter. Jupiter had his own temple and so on and so forth. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so there's this, there's this lag time of, of crossing over and, and transitioning. But the bottom line is, is, that, is that as Greece started to started to decline and Rome started to come up, those two begin to merge their cultures. They begin to transition from one to another. And what kind of a culture do we have today? Is it a is it a Jewish culture or a Hebrew culture? No. Do is it a Christian culture? Well it used to be a little bit, but what is it prime what is the culture primarily? It's a Greco Roman culture. And, and unfortunately, folks, we have been interpreting the Bible through Greco-Roman eyes and the culture of the Greco-Roman empires. And that's why so many of even God's people, churches, say, well, it doesn't make any difference what day we worship on. And it doesn't make any difference if we do this or we do that or we do something else. It's all under the blood and Jesus conquered it. So everything's OK. I want to tell you it's not OK, because in the end, all of this is going to evolve back into the abomination of desolation, just like Jesus said it would in the last days. Right. Zeus, Hellenism and Greek mythology is what was, what was re represented on that altar. And I'm just giving you a brief, brief, brief overview of what you were dealing with, with that abomination of desolation. And that is coming again. Mm -hmm. Because it pertains to when? It pertains to the time of the end. Daniel repeats it, or I should say Gabriel in the interpretation repeats it. It pertains to the appointed time of the end. Amen? But we must understand is that it doesn't, it didn't start in Greece, did it? It didn't start in Rome and it didn't, I mean, it didn't start in the Greco-Roman culture. Where did it start? It started in Nimrod's Babylon. 
It started with Nimrod and the mystery of Babylon all the way back on the plains of Shinar. Okay? And we must understand that Hanukkah, Hanukkah is a light. It's the festival of lights. Okay? The dedication, but it's also known as a festival of lights. Hanukkah is a light that shines and says, no, it's the antithesis of everything that was represented on that altar. Does everybody understand? It is not a substitute for Christmas. It is the antithesis of Christmas. And you say, Norm, I don't understand how you get that. All you've talked about is Hanukkah. So the question is, what does this have to do with Christmas? Because all I've talked about is Hanukkah. But Yeshua didn't say, <coughs> let the reader understand Christmas. He said, let the reader understand the abomination of desolation that took place during the time of Hanukkah. He said, you understand that. And guess what? You'll understand the abomination of desolation in the days ahead. Hallelujah. And so now that we've, now that we've laid that foundation of what Hanukkah was about, what took place, and what the abomination of desolation represented on that altar. Why the end of the age and the actual return of Messiah did not take place in 70 AD, but is yet to come. We're going to talk about that and how Christmas works all works into that from a religious standpoint. We're going to cover that next week because we are out of time. I just want to thank everybody for um, your faithfulness uh, to God and coming back to uh, his ways, coming back to his appointed times. And one of the things that I wanted to say, um, and I'm glad I've got, a little, I've got a little time. One of the things that I wanted to say is, is that the Lord is, has spoken to me and, and, his, and Deborah as well, is that, is that I believe that for many people this year, is a crossroads for you. Mm-hmm. That that this year God has been speaking to you about all of this stuff, about getting back to his ways, getting back to his feast, getting back to his appointed times. And some of you have have embraced that and you have and you haven't done it perfectly and don't worry about that, but your heart has been bent toward coming back to the ways of the Lord. Some of you understand w- most of what I've talked about but you haven't made that choice. You haven't actually implemented that in your life or, or implemented that in the life of your family. And this is not a threat or anything like that. But I just really believe that what the Lord has been speaking to me and the fact that Christmas, you know, what w- next Saturday is December 24th. It's the day of Christmas Eve. And we're going to be talking about where Christmas came from. And, and whether that is of God or whether that's not of God and how that plays into, does that play a role in the abomination of desolation in the days ahead? And I'm not going to give you the answer. I, I want to, I want to, you're going to have to wait till next week. But the bottom line is this, is that, and is, and if you don't want to have to make that choice between now and then, or if you can't make that choice, I encourage you, don't watch next, next, next week. Okay. Because God is going, God is calling us all to a place. That here's the spirit of Elijah. That's, what, that's what's manifesting here. The spirit of Elijah, that forerunner anointing of Elijah. Is I, can, I can hear it crying from, um, from um, Mount Carmel when Elijah went up. And he took on the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And he spoke to the children of Israel and he said... How long will you waver between two, two different decisions, two different opinions? If Yahweh is God, serve him. But if Baal is, and if Baal is God, serve him. But make up your mind what you're going to do because the time is over. The time is up. And so this year, as we head into this winter season, which kind of, the whole Christmas and Hanukkah kind of kicks it off. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And the fact that, that Christmas falls right smack dab in the middle of Hanukkah this year. And that, and that Hanukkah starts on the, 
on the eve of the winter solstice is just a is just a light that says I want to draw the distinction between between God's way and the kingdom of God and the worship of Yahweh and his Messiah from the worship of the things of the world, not only in those days through the Greek culture and Hellenism, but also what's coming in the days ahead and how religion is going to play a huge role in bringing everybody together to worship that image on that image, that 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 abomination of desolation that will be will be set up again on the temple, I believe personally We'll just have to wait and see, but it's most likely going to be on the on the uh, t- on the altar of the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, and we have to be ready for it, folks. So be ready next week. Get bring your Bibles, get your family, bring them together, let them see this because we are going to draw the distinction between the clean and the unclean, the holy and the unholy, the righteous and the unrighteous, and God help us to move in your direction and move away from the things of this world, the abominations that are out there, and come into the fullness of who you are. Let's pray. Father, we just love you and we thank you for your goodness and for your love and your mercy toward us. And Lord, we just, uh, uh, we just ask you to seal this teaching in our hearts, help us to understand, uh, and then prepare us, Lord God, for next week as we come back and we deal with the mystery of Christmas. And what that's all about and how that relates or doesn't relate to Hanukkah and the things of God. So, Father, we just bless you. We thank you for the people now. And we pray and ask this believing that you bless your people this week now. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you. See you next week. Same time, same place. Shabbat shalom.